So we're going to get now into the fourth section. You got in the morning, I hope, uh, what I was supposed to be giving last class. So you have all the, all the data. And basically there what I'm putting for you is all the agreements that you do have in Asia and in Africa and in the Middle East. Okay? So take a look at them. And uh, if you have any questions, please bring them to class and we can discuss it here. But what you, will hear, you, what you will get, and I'm hoping that she did, I don't know whether Ana Maria already sent it to you, but she must have sent to you the last uh, um, file of the class that we had and didn't have last time. Okay? We had the class, but we spent all the time in discussion. And uh, part of what I was supposed to be presenting to you, which is what are the agreements in existence in Africa, in Asia, and in the Arab countries, you should take a look at them simply because it's important for you to know what's happening in the rest of the world, okay? They are not very important for Mexico, that is true, but at the same time they are happening. And if you are going to work in any big company, at some point you will be reaching those kind of countries, okay? So take a look at that file, and if you have questions on any of the things that will be, this is not this one, it's the one that I sent you this morning, then please bring questions next Wednesday, okay? But what we're going to be looking now is Mexico. So we're going to be looking at what happened in Mexico. And the first thing is what I call a complicated path to liberalization. So we're going to be discussing, and probably we'll be spending most of this hour and a half discussing this very single idea. And then, of course, we have a, tra a trade agenda for Mexico. There is a question for all of you that you have to be concerned about if you're going to be working in businesses in Mexico. And the question is, um, what is it, what, what's the philosophy of Mexico at this point in terms of opening the economy? Is it really something that everybody believes in? Or do we have all kinds of reactions against it, for it? So where are the problems that we may be facing as a, an economy if all of a sudden some people start telling things like, OK, you have the educational reform. Now we don't want the reform. We're going to go for a counter reform. Things like that are happening right now in Mexico in terms of something which is essential. And that in theory already has been approved by Congress. The constitutional reform has been made in the educational part. And look at the reaction of very specific interest groups. The problems that we are facing in the reform on education today give you a message of the kind of resistance that you will be facing as a country in many aspects, because they are all linked to something which we are going to be looking at at this point. And what I call, you know, the state benefactor, that's the state which defines itself as the one that should guarantee the people's you know, will and goodwill, the, the situation of the people, the, the, the way that they should be living and getting a nice life, okay? So there is in Mexico a concept of what's called the state benefactor, a state that is supposed to provide jobs, health, education, happiness to people. Why? Because they were born in Mexico. And so there is, there is a right to people just because they were born in Mexico, and they are Mexicans, to obtain as a guarantee, and it is in the Constitution, as a guarantee, you are supposed to get job, good jobs, meaning by that a dignified job, health, education, opportunities. So when, when you listen to things like the ones that you're listening right now, of people who are studying in the school to become a teacher, where they bring a demand, and the demand that they are bringing is saying, I am going to finish my school, normal. I am going to get my title or diploma as teacher. And I should have a job when I finish that school. The whole root of that comes from the fact that in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s of the past century, the idea was the state should guarantee these things to people. And one of the things that the state should guarantee was a job. Okay? So this is, this is not free. This is not coming from all, all of a sudden we have all these people and they just invented something. This is part of the tradition that we have, the culture that we have. And as a result of that culture, we are facing this type of resistance to changes for a country that should adapt itself now to the 21st century, which is a completely different century compared to the 20th century. But that's the reason also why it's so important for you to understand that when you look at things like the things that are happening 
in Venezuela or in Argentina or in contrary to that, it has echo in Mexico because there is a group of people in Mexico which still believe that those are the important things. That a state like the Argentinian state, which is now providing jobs, which is doing this, which is doing that, is the kind of government that you should have in Mexico. So it's not guaranteed to you that our society has already bought what we have bought as part of this institution, okay? We believe in free trade, we believe in entrepreneurship, we believe in freedom of the people, these kind of things. Okay, but all of that is a very different philosophy from a philosophy of people thinking the state is the one that should provide and guarantee job, health, education, and therefore happiness to the people, okay? But it comes from the revolution, and it's important that you understand that. Because for many of us, because we don't read history, then we don't understand where many of the roots of these problems that we are seeing right now really began. They began in the 1930s. They began in the Mexican Revolution. They began after the Mexican Revolution. They began as part of the process of the pacification of the country in the years, you know, 1920s, 1925s, 30s. And as a result of that, we have all these myths. One of them is oil. You don't touch oil because as part of the government that was providing this, we nationalize the oil industry and therefore we cannot now privatize it. I mean, this is, <laughs> if you go and you sit with anyone who's not a Mexican, they simply understand why the Mexicans are so concerned about this fact that you cannot privatize the oil industry. Because it makes no sense from the perspective of a person in the 21st century. When you look at globalization, the way things are being put together. But, but then if you think about the history of Mexico, if you see the role of someone like Lázaro Cárdenas and what it means in terms of the overall political development of our country, then you understand why this thing is such an important thing in the Mexican psyche. And, and if you don't understand that, you cannot deal with it, okay? Because then you come and you say, ah, these people are dumb. Yes, but you know, it's not that they are dumb, it's that they have a tradition and that tradition has marked people in this country. Our left, in many ways, is not a modern left because they still are clinging to this tradition. And when you see manifestations in countries like Argentina, in countries like Venezuela, of that type of behavior, which used to be the behavior in the 1940s, 50s, of our politicians, then this group of politicians in Mexico look at it and say, you see, it's happening. So it is possible. Look at what's happening in Venezuela. Look what's happening in Uruguay. Look what's happening in Argentina. And, and you may criticize that. But if you're going to do that, you have to understand why you do criticize that, how you make the argument, and you have to respect also the fact that some of these people really believe on it, okay? When they believe in these things, then we have to Respect that. They may be wrong. I personally think they are wrong, okay? But even if they are wrong, you have to respect their beliefs. And you have to say, well, okay, let's discuss the repercussions of that. So what we did last class was a little bit of that is, yeah, take your position, defend your position, but respect the position of the other person, and then try to provide arguments back and forth. This, you know, the, the truths which are one, single, and absolute are very few, <laughs> okay? Most of things will have good things and bad things. And what we're trying to do is bring the best things because they give me more pluses than minuses. But there is going to be minuses in most of the policies that we will apply simply because we are going to be in many cases going against policies that have been previously applied. So what you see this and what we're going to be talking is about that, the complications and why is it so difficult to understand the true meaning of opening the economy in a country like Mexico, okay? And then we have to define, well, if that's going to be the case, can we really open the economy? What is the real meaning? So whenever we talk about things like, we're going to be integrating ourselves with the United States, <laughs> yeah, I believe that makes a lot of sense, but that implies that we're going to go against the tradition of you know, the past 100 years. Are we really going to be doing that? Are we going to be able to do that? And if there is no quick benefits that people see, then it becomes very complicated 
because what people opposed to that are going to start doing is indicating all the wrongs that are happening because of the new policies that we are applying. Okay? You, have, you have to look at these things. And then, of course, is what it means for me going into all these regional agreements that I have. You know, the president is right now in China. And he's talking about reopening the relationship with China and so on and so forth. Um, I can tell you, I mean, this has been a discussion for at least for the past 20 years, okay? I mean, this is not new. I mean, I can, I can, I can dress it as new because it's important for me to dress it as new, okay? I'm the new Minister of Foreign Affairs, and so I'm going to walk on and say, every time I was wrong, I'm doing everything fantastic. Yeah, that's what I said when I was there, and that's what everybody says, okay? But in the end, you learn lessons, and the lessons that you learn is, how can we compete with China? What are the kind of issues that we have to put on the table. How are we going to be convincing our private sector that opening our economy to the Chinese economy makes sense? And it's not easy. If you don't believe me, just look at the discussion of Dragon Mart. Okay? This is a key discussion right now. Here you have a situation which exemplifies everything that we are talking right now. A group of Chinese companies are coming to Mexico. They are going to be opening a huge commercial center in Cancun. The governor of the state and the people and the authorities of the state of Quintana Roo have agreed with that. The moment it is announced, you have the reaction against it. Now, have you seen that? I'm asking you really as class. So take a look at that issue that's happening today in this economy. If we really believe in an open economy, why is this is a strong reaction against Dragon Mart taking place. Doesn't make sense. I mean, we really are convinced of free trade and so on. Let them be there. Who cares? And yet, there is a big discussion. But the political issue then comes through. Because the state had already agreed. The state now is saying, well, as long as the local legislation Yes, they have fulfilled it and we have given the authorization. But of course, they have now to go and discuss the national legislation on the environment, this, that. And so, now the state is saying, it's not my problem, even though it started as my problem because I'm the one who brought them into this place. But now, since I'm getting all this international, national <laughs> reaction, I'm saying, oh, I did my part, but of course, it depends on the federal government now. So, Minister of Economy is your job now. Minister of, of, of Environment is your job to say no. Because then I can say, as a state government, I want it, but you see. But at the same time, the pressure now is going to go to the federal government. Now, you can imagine that what is going to take place in the next 24 hours is a clear discussion between the president of China and the president of Mexico where this is going to be one of the subjects of discussion. It's not going to be in the agenda, but it's going to be in the discussion. And so the discussion is going to be from a government which is very pushy in terms of trade, the Chinese government, saying to the Mexican government, what's going on you know, with this Dragon Mart thing? Are you a country which is supposed to be supporting as a champion all these free trades? So you, please read it, okay? Read what's happening with Dragon Mart, because that gives you an idea of what is the reaction that you can get in a country like Mexico to an announcement of the opening of this free trade, in quotes, <laughs> trade center. And so it's, it's going to be interesting. And, you know, and I'm just adding the seven point because I think it's important for you to learn a little bit about migration issues. So what is our path to trade liberalization? Well, the first thing you have to understand, and, you know, is after the Second World War, we really went, as Latin America, in a concept of how can we reach development and this is an invention of our region. Okay? A man called Raúl Previch, who at the time was the head of ECLAC, or CEPAL in Spanish, okay? the Economic Commission for Latin America. Raúl Previch is probably one of the strongest thinkers in what should be the development process of a country. 
Previous as head of the CLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America, which is a United Nations, well, part of the United Nations. Right now, by the way, it is the head of ECLAC is a woman, and it's a Mexican woman, okay? It's Alicia Barcenas. Alicia Barcenas is right now the head of ECLAC. The, 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 the place where they are located is in, in, uh, in Santiago, Chile. They do all the analysis for the United Nations of what should be the economic development of the region. Well, previous in the years 50s of the past century, was the man in charge of that, and he was also a very strong thinker. So he was a very good economist, and he made an argument, and the argument that he made is, terms of trade are normally against nations who export raw materials and in favor of countries who export manufactured goods. So Nancy, what is the meaning of that? What's, what's the concept of the terms of trade are turning against nations whose chief exports are raw materials and are in favor of exports of manufactured products? Why is it an important argument? Because uh, maybe uh, it's like blocking uh, the free trade with other countries. Okay. You have your advisor on your right side. Ask him to advise you. Ask him, ask him, ask him, ask him. No, no, no. You are the president of the republic, and therefore, you don't need, need to be the expert in everything, but you have your advisor on your right side, or behind you, or in front of you. Choose. Hmm? Which one do you choose as your advisor? Okay. I think that is because... You have to explain to the president, okay? So she can tell me later on. Read the statement, okay? Don't jump into conclusions. Read the statement. It says, if I'm looking at this, previous is telling me, terms of trade, so what are the terms of trade of a country? The relative prices between what and what? The, the goods you're exporting and goods you're importing, yeah? Okay, so we're discussing that. Remember, this is a very strong maximum. Mm -hmm. Read and then think, okay? So, what we're talking about right now is the following. It's called the terms of trade, yeah? This is an invention of the World Bank. And what I'm saying is, look, what do I, what do I need if I'm gonna be doing trade? What do I need things from outside for? What do I need imports for? Why do we import things? So you can specialize in the Okay, according to the theory of international trade, one of the things that we want to do is we want to specialize in trade. And as we specialize, all of us are going to be getting benefits, yeah? So trade is important because it brings benefits to every one of us. That's what we saw in the first section of the course. And if I agree on that and I believe in that, then what am I exporting, what am I importing will be important. And so what we're saying is, well, if you are a developing nation, yeah, what's going to be your situation? Well, you probably won't have, if you are a developing nation, you probably won't have a manufacturing sector. Because your population is going to be working where? Well, most of my population are going to be working in the agricultural or, if you wish, the primary sector of the economy. So what's the primary sector of the economy? And what is raw material? What's a raw material for you? Give me one. Oil? Oil is a raw material? How come? Copper. Why is copper a raw material? Because it's raw. I just get it from the ground and I pass it on. Yeah? So I call them raw materials because they are raw materials. And what I'm saying is there is no processing in the process of bringing them to the market. So what I do is I just extract them. Okay. 
But agriculture, well, there is some processing, but the processing of agriculture is just, you know, the sowing of the, 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 the product and then getting as harvest. So the point that we are making is, if I really believe in this definition that there are three sectors in the economy, one is the primary sector, which is going to be basically raw materials. Raw materials are going to be then basically what? My minerals? Okay. Can be gold, can be whatever. Can be oil, just extracted. Just the oil extracted, not processed or refining. And then I'm going to be having agricultural goods. But this is it. I'm not processing goods. I'm getting the corn, I'm getting the wheat, I'm getting whatever, and I don't process. I just have the raw material and I send this. But if I go into the secondary sector, you know, then I know that this is the sector of manufacturing. And then I go into the tertiary sector. And in the tertiary sector, I'm talking about services. services okay? But more and more, I'm having as part of this tertiary or secondary, wherever you want to put it, something which we call now the knowledge economy. Yeah? So when I sell a smartphone, I'm selling really knowledge. Because what I need to do is I need to develop a product that will satisfy now many services, many things, but in a different way. So our economy has been, you know, in, a, in a global sense, has been developing in this concept. Well, at the time of this gentleman, you were up to here, okay? And what you were saying at the time was, a developing nation by its structure has most of the population working in the primary sector of the economy. So they're going to be doing mostly mining, fishing, agriculture. If that's what they are doing as a society, what they are producing is those products, okay? If I am the United States of America or one of the developed nations, I, in addition to these things, I'm doing also manufacturing. Okay? Manufacturing is cars, or whatever, okay? You want the cola industry, okay? Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, the cola industry, bottling. And so as I move in that, and I started going into this trade policy, I started looking at something that's happening in the world. People value the manufacturing goods more than they value the primary goods. Okay? Because as their income goes high, as it grows, as it increases, if I am making 100 pesos, I probably will be spending 70% or 75% of my budget buying what? Buying food, you know, essentials. But as my income goes, grows, becomes higher, the proportion that I am going to be spending in this primary element is going to be reducing. As that reduces, the extra income I'm making is extra income to buy things which before I thought they were not necessary and today I think it's necessary. To the extreme that um, I hope you don't do that, a lot of people walk zero and drives a lot. Yeah? So I'm going to go to the house of my mother. Where is it? Three blocks from here. Let's walk. Oh, no, come on. Let's take the car and we park in there. There are all the theories of consumism and everything that I'm hope, hoping that you also discuss in your classes. But right here, the point I'm making to you is, as I have a higher income, I want to buy higher value goods. And the higher value goods in general were at the 50s determined by manufacturing goods. So, the theory of trade will tell me that it is good for the countries to specialize in what they have a competitive advantage, which will be then for developing nations, primary goods, for 
developed nations manufacture goods. And everybody will be happy. And so, pff, let's be happy. What Prebisch said is, you know what happens when you do that? If you accept the theory of trade, what's going to happen is the price of primary goods, of raw materials, is going to go down and the price of manufactured goods is going to go up. Because there is going to be more and more and more demand for these products, less and less for this one. As that happens, the countries who specialize in primary goods, raw materials, are going to get less money as a proportion of the price that they will have to pay for manufacturing goods. So their terms of trade, which is going to be price of exports over price of imports, is going to go in the direction of less than zero. Negative sense, OK? They're going to be losing ground. Because originally, we start with one to one. As we specialize and we go into this development process, the ones who are developing manufacturing are going to start getting better prices. And so what's going to happen for a country like Mexico, for a country like Brazil, for a country like the Latin American countries, we're talking the 50s of the past century, is that the relationship between the price of the exports, which are raw materials, and the price of their imports, which are manufactured goods, is going to go against them. Every time this ratio is going to be lower and lower and lower. Okay? It's more expensive to buy goods from outside because they are manufactured, and you get less money for your goods because they are raw materials. Your terms of trade are deteriorating. That was the whole theory of Raoul Previs, okay? Ergo, if that's going to happen, what do you need to do? I still don't understand what, what's the meaning of terms of trade. Are they exports and imports? Sorry, or they are, okay. It's, if I take all my exports and I value them under prices, and I take all my imports and value them under prices, I'm going to get a relationship, okay? So let's suppose that we start. Let's assume that we only sell two things in the world, yeah? This is the simplest and easiest way of showing. I am Mexico. And I only export oil. Not gasoline, oil, okay? I am the USA, and I only export cars. This is a simplification. What is the price of oil? It's, uh, let's say, $30 per barrel. What is the price of the car? Let's say $10,000 for a car. If I am going to use this, then I say the relationship between my exports and my imports, I'm talking prices only, okay, is going to be this. So, you know, it's three one thousandths at the beginning. And then I say, but as we start exporting more because of this concept, the price of oil remains the same, but the price of the car goes up. Okay? As that happens, I had three one thousands. What's going to be now my combination? Three Okay, so what you have right now is more or less. Three divided by a thousand is more or less than three divided by two thousand. So. Less. Less. You are getting less, yeah? <laughs> and so as a result of that, so as a result of that, your terms of trade deteriorate, yeah? Now, what this really means is to buy the same car, I now need to export more oil than I used to do before, okay? Now, this is simply a price effect. I may still produce the same amount of oil and you may still produce the same amount of cars. The difference is now, because the price of this one went up and mine didn't, I need more oil now to buy the car than I used to do before. 
So the terms of trade, the relative prices between your exports and my e import, or my exports and your exports, is I am losing now. And the reason why I'm losing is because I'm exporting raw materials and you're exporting manufacturing goods. Yeah? Is that clear to all? Uh, if that is true, and it is true because I studied everything that has happened since 1945 till 1955, and I'm telling you it's happening that way. Okay? I'm not just inventing. I'm showing you numbers of what's happening in trade in the world. And as this is happening, the demand for goods which are manufactured is higher, and therefore their prices have been going up, and the demand for raw materials is lower because their demand in relative terms has gone down. The terms of trade of people who export raw materials is getting worse and worse and worse as time goes by. If that is the truth, then what do I need to do as a country not to suffer that deterioration of my income. Remember, I want to develop the country. Eh? What do I need to do? I'm the president. So let's go back to you. You are the president. Now, what do we do? Uh, produce uh, manufactured products with my raw materials. In other words, what you're going to say to me is, people, if we want to be a developed country, we want our beneficials, our benefits as a society to grow, we need to change strategy. We cannot continue to be a country who only works on raw materials. We now become a country who works on manufactured goods. Okay. So all of a sudden, I walk to you and I said, according to Prevish, I need to move into a policy that will develop the manufacturing sector of my economy. Yeah? It was very simple, you know? This is what happened in the 50s. Because this is true, if I keep on that route, my raw materials will buy less and less of the manufactured goods. My society wants to buy more manufactured goods because it is manufactured goods that gives me the extra benefit as a society. People are happier when they have cars than when they don't have. And so we need to move into a different development policy. And my new, I'm gonna, and my new development policy is very simple. Let's go for industrialization. This country needs to create an industry so they can go into manufacturing. Is that why Mexico has the import institution to develop yeah. the But the question that was never asked, you see? And that's what's very important for us to understand why we are where we are right now. What I'm saying to you is you need to move into a policy where you will be producing manufacturing goods. That implies that you have to industrialize your country. So whereas your original policy after the revolution. So what is the motto of our revolution, guys? What did Mr. Zapata say to the Mexicans? Tierra y libertad. So what is the meaning of that? Freedom. That's nice. I like that too. And land. Okay, if it is land, what is going to be the policy of the government? No, 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 no. Who cares about oil? Yeah, because what is the meaning of land? Yes. See, you have to understand these things. That's what's important that you read Mexican history, okay? You should read any kind of history, but Mexican history is essential for Mexicans. Otherwise, you are Mexicans with American history. So you want to be Mexicans with Mexican history, you have to understand what happens in the 1910s, 1920s, okay? As we go into this process, one of the things that happens is 
land becomes a very important term. But if I'm talking land, I'm talking agriculture, okay? And if I'm talking agriculture, I'm talking development of the agricultural sector. And therefore, my policy is going to be a policy for agriculture. This is the origin of our agricultural bias, okay? That's fine. I have no problem with that. The problem is, I came and I said, it's going to be what? Distribution of land. I want people to be owner of their land because that's exactly what the revolution was all about. The bad guys were the owners of the big, big, huge farms. Those landowners are the ones who create all the problems in Mexico. And therefore, tierra y libertad means I want to have my own piece of land. In another class that I teach, which is Mexican economics, one of the things that I show is, is, is a, a very emotional video of an old man who is interviewed 30 years, 40 years after the revolution. And, and you can see the situation of poverty in which he is living, okay? But when they ask him, what do you think he says? They gave us our dignity. And the guy explains in his own words the difference between being a man who worked for someone and got basically nothing in return and working for himself and getting basically nothing in return, okay? He doesn't say that, obviously, but the point he makes is, I got my dignity. I am the owner of my land. No, no, no. It's, 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 yeah. All of these are emotional issues, okay? All of us would prefer to live, but you know, given the fact of what I'm doing, it, the message is very emotional. You have to understand that. I mean, this is, very, this is part of our pride. Well, if land is one of the issues of the Mexican Revolution, the governments that will emanate from the revolution will be looking at the agricultural sector as one of the important sectors in the economy because that's really where they wanted to do the justice of the revolution. If you have 85% of the people working in the agricultural sector at the time that we're talking about, then what you have to understand is that if I am the government, my initial policies are going to be policies for the development of the agricultural sector. But one of the aspects more important and one of the worst things that happen to our system is people ask for distribution of land. People ask to be owner of a piece of land. And so you end up doing two things because you become a socialist state in many ways, and you have this mentality, you say, fine, but it's not going to be property that you can own, it's going to be a hidos, okay? Because I'm watching what's happening in Russia, in the Soviet Union, and that's the way that we should be doing things. You should be getting land where you are the owner, but it's part of a community, and that community is called a hido. And so the property in Mexico became Propiedad digital, okay? And if it's propiedad digital, then it is shared. <laughs> it's not yours. And as you keep doing that, this is terrible because what's going to happen is you are part of a community and you have to take community decisions, okay? But in addition, you cannot sell your land. You can transfer your land to your family. And so what happens is you started with 10 hectares, and then you had two kids, and so you gave me to each one of them five hectares. And as you kept doing this, our agricultural sector, in addition to the problems of Prebish, became very inefficient. Because the structure of property was a structure that would not really go in favor of efficiency. You know, you need a tractor. But the tractor to be efficient needs a certain amount of land. Otherwise, you have a nice tractor, you can ride on it, but you will finish very quickly your one hectare of land, okay? So it becomes a combination of things. But this is important because then I am the state 
I am the one who makes the distribution, and I am the one who gives the benefits. Because they're going to be very inefficient, I am the provider of benefits for these people. And so what I do, I started only giving subsidies, yeah? And as a state, I give subsidies, they are happy, they vote me back, and I am the government. And I remain in power for 70 years. This is a good model, okay? But it's a combination of economics, justice, and the state being responsible to provide the benefits. You have to understand, we're talking 1930s. Okay? We're not talking 2010. We're talking 1930s. This is the mentality, it's coming out of a revolution. You have all these problems. The world has all these views. The Soviet Union is there. There is all these different manifestations. The combination of that is creating an agricultural policy which is very inefficient. The country stops growing. It's not growing anymore. And then all of a sudden a guy comes in the 1950s and says, the way to development is industrialization. Okay? As this guy says industrialization, what he says to all of us is, how do you industrialize? Now, what would be your thought? You are in 1955, 1950 to give you a chance. Process? Yeah. You agree with me that we have to nationalize, no, I'm sorry, that we have to industrialize, yeah? That now the policy that we should be pushing for is not really agriculture, but it is industry. This is an important change, okay? But if I'm going to do that, how do I do it? How do I industrialize the country? Technology, Everything fantastic. What is the demand for my products? Why? Because that way, um, the products that are maybe more competitive in other parts can enter your market, and the only product your market can consume is yours. So, this is one way, yeah? Yeah? Is there another way? See? If you cannot think of any other way, imagine people in the 50s, okay? The point was, yes, there was another way, but you didn't choose it. The other way was, don't substitute imports, really push for exports. So there are two countries that are very clearly you know, showing these things. One of them is Korea, or if you want to call it now South Korea, okay, which is now on the verge of disappearing. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have Mexico. If I decide industrialization through exports is quite different than if I decide industrialization through imports, okay? And what we decided was import substitution. Why? Why do you think that we decided? Think as a politician right now. You, you still want to be president of Mexico, or, or you are going to pass the mantle somewhere? <laughs> okay. If you are still the president of Mexico, you look at this thing, why is it easier for you to think import substitution rather than export orientation? Maybe because Mexico... She said, she was your advisor for a little while. What did she say? Uh, because we have uh, plenty of raw materials and agricultural... That's true. What else? What did she say? You see? Have to listen. What did you say, Maria? Um, that if you close your borders, there is no other product that can compete with yours. And why are you interested in closing your borders? And why do you think that there is going to be a market for your products? But why? Why, why? why are we calling this thing import substitution? What are we substituting? Maybe to have it? No. <laughs> I mean, 
I, I may not be expressing myself correctly. I am using the term import substitution. What I'm going to substitute? Yeah. So what I'm, how are they called in my country? Import substitution. How are they called? Imports. Yeah. Are they called imports? Yeah, they are called imports. Yeah. If I'm using import substitution, what I'm doing is I'm substituting what? Imports. <laughs> yeah. Am I going to substitute what? I am going to substitute imports. That's all. Isn't that what it means? Sometimes, as it is written, is the meaning, okay? So, import substitution, okay, implies I am going to substitute imports, okay? How was the trade like in those years? Oh, we're going to see some tables. It was nice. The problem is, if I am convinced that what Prevish is telling me is true, then what I know is if I continue with this policy, I am not going to be able to develop the country as fast and as quickly as I would like to do it. Okay? And so, what I'm deciding then is a true change in policy. A true change in policy. And the change in policy that I'm deciding is... I'm moving away from a policy of agriculture, support, development, etc., to a policy of industrialization in Mexico. Okay? If I'm going to go into policy of industrialization in Mexico, I can take two tacks. I can do it through exports, and that implies I'm going to be selling my products in the rest of the world, or I can substitute imports. Okay? Why do I choose import substitution over export promotion, if you wish. Because import substitution means I already know the size of the market that I'm going to have. Because the size of the market is my internal market. Yeah? Because what I know is Mexico is importing 200,000 cars. Therefore, the market for cars in Mexico is 200,000. So, if I put a car industry in Mexico, the car industry knows that they can sell 200,000 cars. Yeah? And so I go to a person and I say, Guess what? I have a big deal for you. There is a market in Mexico of 200,000 cars. If you produce cars in Mexico, you are the only one who will be able to sell cars in Mexico. Because what I'm going to give you is the internal market of cars. For you to do that, you have to establish A factory that produces cars. Yeah? Is that easy? Is it, that sounds really... Yeah. Great. What am I giving you if I do that? First thing that we are doing is what? We are doing protectionism, yeah? Because that implies I need to restrict imports into the country. So I need to restrict the imports into the country, and that's the only way that I'm going to be creating the internal market for my industry to take hold. Second thing is, who knows how to make cars? Do you know how to make a car? Seriously? Yeah. But I'm going to give you the market for 200,000 cars. Do you take the business or you don't? You wouldn't? Would you? You see, males are always like that, you know? They always go for, for the profit, the instant profit, okay? Of course you will, because what you will say is, okay, I'll find someone who knows how to do it. I have a big deal. I am now the only one who can sell cars in Mexico. Because I know how to do it? No. Because the government gave me the concession. Yeah? 
So who cares whether I know or not? I got the concession. If I got the concession, I'm going to get someone who knows how to make cars. Don't worry. But think even worse than that. Who cares? Let's make a terrible car. Anyway, who else can buy another car? Do you want a car? Is my car or no car? Which one? My car. OK. Hey, but your car doesn't work, and, and you know I have a lot of problems. Go and buy another one. Who sells cars? I do, so go and buy another one. <laughs> Please, buy another one. I want to produce more cars. Well, I, I'm joking, but I'm telling you what's happening, OK? What happened is, if you go through this route, what you are doing is you are creating an inefficient industry in your country, OK? Because your industry is protected. And it's protected because what I'm saying as part of the policy is, I go against the trade policy that we discuss, which is open the economy, allow things to happen exactly the opposite way. I'm going to be closing the economy, and I'm going to be protecting my market for my producer. Now, does my producer have to be Mexican? I don't care. He's my producer. He puts the fabric, he puts the factory in my country. Okay? And as he puts the factory in my country, I am going to be developing the technology. And therefore, I am going to start being able to produce manufactured goods. And they told me that if I do that, I am going to be going the route of development. Because now the terms of trade, in addition to everything else, are going to go in my favor. But think about the consequences, and I'm going to give you the word right now. Think about the consequences of this. As a government, if I have already 200,000 cars as the market, and I put a factory to produce 200,000 cars, compared to the past, I had a factory producing how many cars? Before I did this, how many factories? Zero. Zero. I had no factory, yeah? So it was producing zero cars. I was bringing all the cars from outside. Now I know that I have a market of 200,000 cars. And now I'm going to be setting up a factory that is going to produce 200,000 cars. And that is going to give me 10,000 jobs. But in addition, because these jobs are in an industry which are cars which pay very well they will get very good salaries. So the 10,000 people who work now in the car industry, not only did they get a job that they didn't have before, they also have a job that pays well. Compared to what? To the job they used to have before in agriculture. So my policy of industrialization through import substitution is creating conditions that look good all over the place. And easy and quick, because I did have the market. Whereas, if I go into a policy of export promotion, I am going to have to compete with other people in their markets. And that implies I better be good. Because if I'm not good, they will not buy my product. So, an argument which is called the infant industry. And we saw that as we were discussing WTO. Infant industry then, as an argument, becomes important. I am developing an industry. In the initial stages of developing that industry, they are going to be less competitive than the industries that are already established. So I'm going to be protecting them so they can reach the levels of competitiveness of the industries in the rest of the world. My industry is infant. These are my kids, OK? These are you guys. Hmm? These are the young little kids who are sitting here. And I'm very concerned about them, so I give you everything. Don't worry, you're going to get 10 in your qualification. Uh -uh. You're going to have to study, OK? Because if I don't force you to do that, you're not going to be competitive. 
So I'm not going to give you grades. I'm going to be forcing you to earn your grades. And as you earn your grades, you become competitive with whomever. Ah, uh, but mm -mm, this is what we did. Okay? We followed the process. We transformed this, and we went for a policy of industrialization through import substitution. Okay? This is the policy of the 40s, 50s, 60s in Mexico. This is very important for you to understand. These are years of high growth in the economy. These are years of generation of a middle class in Mexico. Because most of the people who started putting industries became the new industrial class in Mexico. So you had all these people appearing. All of a sudden we have all these big industrial names. But most of them were making money and were making good things, not because they were competitive, but because they had a concession from the government to be the only ones producing in our country. But that was not bad seen at the time. Now, the whole political system is going to be then oriented to that process. I will not say that you should not be the president of Mexico, but you will be giving me the concession for this, for this, for this, for that. And we all make happy combinations. So who, who, who will the president like and uh, so, so Ah, his name is... Wasn't Campus. Yeah, sure. Because did he have the option? No, he didn't have the option. It's not because they wanted to do it, it's because they had to do it. And this is a very important element of this part, okay? Because what we're really talking is, is something which is very, very important for you. Is this part, okay? I have an entrepreneur class who in many ways was conditioned by the fact that they had a protection in their situation. And the most important of that class is the small enterprises. Okay? Because the small enterprises were defended and protected. In the 1930s and 40s, something called the Canacintra. I'm sorry? Canacintra. Ah, no, Canacintra appeared a long time after. Canacintra is Cámara Nacional Industrial. Industrial Transformación. And if you look at the structure of Canacintra as of today, it basically represents the small and medium-sized enterprises. <coughs> okay? Whereas well, you have the CCE, Consejo Coordinador Empresarial, or you have the business group of the 100, which is the huge 100 people. One of the people who's going to come to Reto Negocios is from that group, okay? Well, several, several of them, by the way, on the 100. Well, those are competitive internationally speaking, but the small and medium-sized enterprises have a hard time being competitive, okay? Well, this comes from this. As the whole agricultural thing comes from this, because everything comes from the fact that after the 30s, you know, in 1920s and 30s, we switched in our conception of what should be the country, what should be the government for, and we went into what's called an Estado Benefactor, okay? State whose responsibility is anyone who was born in Mexico has the right to a good job, good health, good education. And it's the state obligation to provide it. What was the whole purpose of the, the exchange trade ban that they used? Oh, but that's a long time after. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, what we're talking about, we will get there. But, you know, what we're talking about, this is going to be a crash three class course in Mexican history. But what you have to understand is the results. Okay? So, if you look at the process of growth in our economy on the assumption of this import substitution, industrialization policy with the state protection in terms of trade and everything else. And you look at the results in growth. From 1956, you have 6.8 growth, 7.6 growth, 5.3 growth, 3% growth, 8.1, 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, 4.11, 4.12,
1-800-497-8117-6569-6381-6369. So, China, look, 56 to 70. Look at my rate of growth, okay? I haven't reached 10%, yes, that's true, once. But look at my numbers, they are very impressive, okay? If you look at the rate of growth of this country, and, and I can bring it down to 1950 and you will still see that, okay? So, imagine the concept of many people saying, wait a minute, when we went into protectionism, import substitution, industrialization, look what happened in this country. So why are you telling me that the route to growth is opening your economy and these things? Because if I show you the results of that, which I want, then you are going to end up with rates of growth on average of 2%, 1.2%. Okay? Last year was a great year for the Mexican economy. What is the rate of growth of last year? 4%. Wow. Ah. And this is what this is the bad one. Okay. Yeah, but the year before that, oh four percent too. And the year before that, oh three percent. And what is the average of the sexenio of Felipe Calderon? One point two percent. What is the average of the Fox regime? Two point five percent. What is the average of the Salinas regime or the Cedillo regime or and and you start thinking, uh, wait a minute, since we got these guys neoliberalists, I mean, God. Uh, and here we have our professor telling us that this is the right policy. And when I look at the results, in terms of growth, and I compare to this period, I find 2.5, 1.2, etc. And when I look at this, Yeah, but inflation. <laughs> Look. Hmm. Exchange rate. Look. Okay. Terms of trade. From 100, we started losing in terms of trade, and then we started winning. But the point was, I was substituting imports, so I don't care. Do you follow my drift, as they say in English, or not? Yeah? What we're talking about is, all of a sudden we have an economy where people look at, how can we develop the country? And the answer to that is, we need to substitute imports. Because if we substitute imports, what we are going to be substituting is manufactured goods. As we go then into a process of industrialization, development of the manufacturing sector in our economy, we have a theory that says that's the way to become a developed country. Because the terms of trade are going to deteriorate against people who are doing raw material exports rather than manufacturing goods. So you're going to win both ways. You're going to win in the sense that you already have a market, you're going to substitute that, you're going to then have less trouble of balance of payments because you are substituting imports and therefore you don't have a problem of balance of payments. But at the same time, you're going to be industrializing your country, creating things which have more value added than the raw materials, therefore winning also in terms of your exchange. And in addition, you're going to be generating employment in your country which you didn't have before because you didn't have those products in Mexico. Everything is rosy, rosy. Okay? You had a question? I don't, but I have one. Why, uh, were they controlling the, the exchange rate, or why is it so different uh, than normal? The policy of the time was fixed exchange rate. Fixed exchange rate, okay? Now, what you have here is the real exchange rate. The relationship between the price of goods according to your inflation and deflation of your main trading partners. And your main trading partner at the time, even today, is the United States. 
So when I look at my exchange rate, my real exchange rate, not my nominal exchange rate, what I can see here more and more and more and more is something which is very complicated for me in the long run. My rate of inflation is higher than the rate of inflation of my most important partner. And because of that, the difference between them and us is creating this appreciation of my exchange rate. So I'm going to be having troubles one way or the other. And so what I look at the long, in the long run is, what I would like to do is, this is helping me because my index was 100, and therefore I'm looking at this situation. Now, this is another important thing. This period is what's called the period of import substitution, but also with stabilization, okay? Sorry? With stabilization, okay? So this is the, the golden age of the Mexican economy, okay? How am I going to convince someone that this is not good? This is maybe how the Lopez Obrador of the city is A little bit worse on this, yes. <laughs> no, but, but that's the problem. The problem is, here I have a guy who has not been able to make the transition mentally to something which is different. And then, you thought that you have cleaned up the world of bad examples. And all of a sudden, a bird shows up and you have Venezuela. Yeah? Or you have a situation like Argentina. Or you have a situation like Brazil, which is very dangerous today. Because what it implies is Brazil is growing, strong, has a good program of elimination of poverty and hunger, and is one of the top countries in the world because it's part of the BRICS. Where is the M in BRICS? Gone. So what I want you to understand, and that's why I put that concept, is Rather than being a decision of opening your economy, in the 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, we took a decision of closing your economy. As you close your economy, you went into a policy called import substitution policy, industrialization through import substitution. As you went into a substitution of imports, and you had a country that started generating jobs, in those industries which now were substituting imports, you created two problems. One is you created inefficient companies because they knew that they will not have to compete internationally and therefore they had to really go for the latest improvements in productivity. Last class you spent all the class saying productivity, productivity, competitiveness of the company. Well, this is exactly the opposite, okay? This is, why do I need that? I am the owner of the concession. As long as I have the concession, there is no one who can compete with me. That's why he said very quickly, yes, I will take it. Because in, in, in the mentality of most of us, the moment that I get a concession, I say, of course, if I'm the only one, just imagine that we were the only university in Mexico. There is no other university, we are the only ones. No matter what I teach you, it makes no difference to me because I'm going to be full of students. Well, this is the problem of some of our public sector educational system. Okay? That's why some of us believe in competition, private, blah, 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 because we think only competition will make you efficient. Okay? Now, this is the opposite. From the 1945 up until the 1970s, you have a protectionist movement. As a result of that, you have growth, you have the increase in the middle class, and you have a country which is getting better and better and better in many ways. Okay? As you do that, there are certain elements which were important that these people, these ones in this period, understood. And they understood that inflation had to be under control. The difference between this period and the previous period is there was a period of desarrollo sin estabilización, okay? 
when they did exactly the same policies, but they didn't care much about inflation. So you had inflationary periods, you had an instability, and you had devaluations. As you had these problems with balance of payments, you had a situation that did not allow you to be stable. And the guys who walked into government in the 1954 period, that's the government of Riz Cortines and people like that, took a decision. And the decision was, the reason why we're having all these problems is because of the public sector deficit. And because we have a public sector deficit, the program of stability implies that we're going to be reducing our public sector deficit to levels that will be manageable. Okay? If you go behind that the years before, you're going to have deficits of 4, 5, 6%. If you go here, they took a decision. Do we control the public finances? As we control the public finances, we have a very low deficit. As we have very low deficit, we have low inflation. As we have low inflation, we put our macro context in shape. Um, th this, this was like bad for uh, long term, right? But for the immediate results, it was very good. And uh, I want to ask you, maybe that was the only way to increase the middle class uh, sector in that time, because it was really quick and... That's what I thought, yeah. There was another way, yeah. They could have gone the way of export. But well, maybe it, it, it was going to be slower, right? Yeah. The transition to the middle class and maybe... Yes, absolutely. How do you lose weight? You go on a crash diet. Yeah? You eat like whatever until summertime. And then three weeks before the summer, you put your bathing suit. You look at yourself and say, my God, <laughs> now I need to lose weight. And then you say, wait, 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 wait. You didn't see yourself for the past 12 months, how you were a little bit gaining weight and getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. <laughs> no, because I was getting a little bit bigger. And so I didn't notice that I was gaining weight. Because you don't gain three kilos. You gain 100 grams, 200 grams, 150 grams. Yeah. And slowly, you have one kilo. And you have two kilos. And then you have five kilos. And then you have 10 kilos. Yeah? And when you reach 10 kilos, it's summertime. But so far, you have been you know, with my dress and what have you. So it doesn't look too bad. But the moment I put the swimming bath, you know, swimming trunk, bulges all over. So as that happens, your immediate reaction is, I have to lose weight. But I have to lose weight in one month. Because I'm going to be in the beaches in a month. And so what do you do? You go and you take a crazy diet. And you have all these diets. La dieta de esto, la dieta del otro, whatever. And so you look at your friends and say, hey, you lost about 10, yeah, I use the rice diet. And it works very nice. Rice every single day. It has to be white rice. I have a friend who does that. And I says, <laughs> says, you know, this is very dangerous for your health. Because if you do that, you're losing a lot of nutrients that you should have. Yeah, but I'm going to lose you know, weight. And I'm, not, I'm just going to do it one month. And he does that, and he loses weight. His name is, if you don't turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's a man from Turkey. He's a very good friend of mine. And every single year, he does the same thing. So, so you say to people, look, don't do that. You control your weight every single day, yeah? And it takes time. If it took you two years to gain 10 kilos, what makes you believe you are going to lose 10 kilos in two days? It will take you at least two years, yeah? If you do things with time, everything will be more solid. But you are absolutely right. First, this is a theory that I believe in. Raul Prevish and his team created a school of development. And if you were part of that school of development, you believed in these things. As you start putting them into practice and they start working, you end up with a situation where not only do you believe in them, but they are giving you the results that you expected. Okay? As they give you the results that you expected, politically and economically, and faster than if you had done it the other way, 
then you feel you are doing great. And you are. Okay? Everything is nice up until 1970. But you ask anyone in Mexico, and they will tell you the golden age of the Mexican economy is desarrollo estabilizador. Okay? Because you have no inflation, you have high growth, you were creating employment, and at the same time, you really got a middle class that was increasing. And yes, you are right. That was the easy way to do it, and it made sense to do it at the time. When you reach 1970, and you find out what I call the end of this policy, in terms of the good benefits, you should have reconsidered the policy and switched to the policy that we have been recognizing for the past 20 years or 30 years, which is export orientation for the economy. What happened so they changed? Well, it happened that we had a president named Luis Echeverria, okay? And uh, who made a question about Andres Manuel? Okay. So take a look at Luis and imagine that that person has many of the ideas of Andres Manuel, because Andres Manuel, in fact, has a lot of ideas from that period. And you will see what could be the result. Because what he did is he walks into this situation. And he gets in his first two years in government what is called in Mexico the atony. That's the no growth situation. From these rates of growth, all of a sudden the economy starts going into zero growth. Because that was the end of the model that had been used. Logically, he should have thought, well, logically, I don't know, logically for me because, I, you know, 20 years back then, Logically, when one looks at the numbers and the things, one says this was the point where the Mexican government should have switched and rather than continue in this import substitution, they should have gone into something called export orientation. Rather than continue to close the economy, you should have gone into opening the economy. But if you don't believe in that, and if you believe that it is the state's responsibility to provide all the goods, then what do you think you are going to do? I'm going to close the economy even more, <laughs> and I'm going to be now buying the companies that lose money because I don't want these companies to stop. Because I am the provider of jobs, and therefore I'm going to do a policy which rather than opening the economy will create even worse conditions of protectionism in this economy. The what, I'm sorry? The tequila crisis. Ah, but that's for, yes, but it's for a different reason. So you were asking me what was the results. I'm, I'm going to come back to that, okay? So we're coming, what are the results? Well, look at the results, it's very nice. This is your balance of payments, okay? These are your exports. Oil and gas, look at the numbers and how they represent them every time. Growing amounts. Okay? Because what happened is, as I get into the 1970 period, and I see that I'm not growing anymore, then I need to do adjustment the size of the state. And I can do that if I'm forced to. <laughs> but if all of a sudden I get something like this, then my will is going to be broken. I hope I, I, I'm not insulting or thinking, using the diet example, okay? I want to be lean and trim because that's the way that when I go to the beach, people will say, look at this handsome fellow, yeah? And then you can say, well, women will like me, or if you are women, men will like me, and then I have this pleasurable conversation or whatever. But if all of a sudden I have a lot of money, a Ferrari, and I'm moving, I am going to be attractive to many people, even if I am not attractive, okay? Because I have so much money that I can show my Ferrari, my this, my that, and people say, yeah, this is a good combination for you. Yeah? 
Here we have some parents pushing people and say, marry him, marry her. Hmm? And the point is, this is what happened to us. Okay? All of a sudden, we're as ugly as we were before, but we got oil. These are the boom years of the oil. But in addition, these are the years when in the world, the price of, gold, of oil went skyrocketing because of the problems that they were facing at the time. Okay? This is the time of the OPEC, and, and they then control money. As you look at that, you have an economy all of a sudden that rather than taking the measures that they should have taken, and rather than using this money to promote exports, did exactly the opposite. Finance, the fact that it was not like that. We have to go. And so protectionism became even worse because all of a sudden we were very, very rich in oil. Okay? Now this is even worse because then <laughs> I don't need to lose weight. I have the money. And so the Mexican economy became exactly that, a bloated economy using the resources of oil to do exactly the opposite of what they should have done. Which is, because I have a protection for my industry, I can now provide more protection because I have the money. And if a company is going bankrupt, I can buy the company. And before I had import restrictions on this, on this, on this, I increase the import restrictions. And then what do I do? I sell products inside Mexico with a subsidy so that people don't suffer this difference. Okay? And that's what we did. So we'll go back to that. And this is the, the, the fact of why we became a protectionist country. You will see the imports and the consumer intermediate capital goods. And as you can see here, one of the things that's going to be a trouble for you is as you go into this import substitution industrialization, you start buying more and more capital goods because you don't have the technology and so you buy the technology. Yes. I don't understand very good the last part. Yeah, but please do me a favor, send me your question, okay? So I can answer your question. So otherwise I'm gonna make a long speech, something that may be a very short answer. Okay, see you in next class. Remember next Friday there is no class.